Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs, and welcome to the Curlin Nascos. The second episode, well, the Curlin Nascos is a Picard after show, and if you want to know why it's called that, look at the artifact just to the left of Jean-Luc in this great thumbnail made by Jason Spriggs, Mr. Raygun himself. We're here to talk about the second episode, Disengage. And to talk about it with me, first of all, of course, I am your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. Welcome to the Burnett Works, soon to be rebranded. Look out for that. And I have brought all the way from the digital bits, Mr. Bill Hunt, to talk about this episode. Bill, thanks for joining me on episode two of the Curlin Nascos, and we are talking about this great episode of Star Trek Picard. Now, you were given the opportunity to see the first six episodes. I have, I have, have indeed, yeah. And then we attended the world premiere at the Chinese Theater together, where we were able to see both episode one and two on the big screen, which is uh, something I would wish for everybody, because boy, oh boy. Oh, there's Charlie. <laughs> There's Charlie. Or is that, or is that, or is that uh, Isis from the episode <laughs> Assignment Earth? Assignment Earth. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, um, obviously we're two episodes in, and yeah. I uh, let me ask you this: with you can't give any spoilers out, right? What is your overall impressions of Star Trek Picard? Boy, I'll tell you what, it is so good, and I know you feel the same way, and I know a lot of people out there feel the same way. It is so good to have actual Star Trek back. Like actual Star Trek, the kind of Star Trek that we know and love is is, is back. And so I'll tell you the first time, I, you know, months ago when you saw the season, months ago when you saw these episodes. When I saw the entire, I have to tell you, I was uh, quite blown away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I it was. You called me. You yeah. Called I me called me home from that experience and said, oh my God, you're not going to believe what I just saw. And when you told me about it, it's like, Without spoilers, but you know, but you definitely said oh, this is oh my god, this is Star Trek. I, I just don't tell okay. anybody how I was able to do that. I don't want my right. sources yeah, yeah, revealed. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I, uh, so I, I thought to myself, okay, okay, if like I know you know, and I trust you, and I trust your take on that, and and so I thought, okay, I, I'm I'm in, man. I'm excited. I'm officially excited. And then when we saw, and I hadn't seen any episodes yet when we went to the premiere at the Chinese Theater a couple of weeks ago. Um, and first of all, see, you know, all the cast and the crew and, and seeing everyone there and all our old, all our friends that we know in the industry and all the great Star Trek people and the Akutas and everything that was extraordinary and seeing the episodes on the big screen on the big screen was extraordinary. But the moment those episodes started, the moment in that first episode, when you see in the 25th century, it's like, oh my God, okay, this is something different. This is something different than we've seen since like 2005, right? It's, this is, this is, that's a good, very good sign because you remember in Axanar, we were, which we both worked on, we were going to do something very similar at the, in the front has a kind of a signal to longtime fans that like the people making this understand what Star Trek is. Now I should say that Bill and I were collaborating. We were involved with the ill-fated Star Trek fan film project, <laughs> Axanar, and you and I, <clears throat> I had edited Prelude to Axanar, and then based on that, famously, the production raised lots of money. Um, you and I first collaborated on what we called the Vulcan scene. You can look yes. it up right now, the Axanar, the Vulcan scene, and it was something that I sort of inherited, so I was going to direct this feature film, and I thought it was important after Prelude to Axanar, which is a faux documentary, that we showed, well, what would the feature version of it look like? What could we do? And there yeah. was this, that we called it the Vulcan scene, but but I had you, I had rewritten it, and I didn't like what I had rewritten. It was in the original script, but it wasn't very good. Yeah. And so I I called you up and I said, can you help me rewrite this scene? Yeah. And yeah. you basically rewrote what we ended up shooting, and it was a proof of concept scene. And Gary Graham comes back and he plays Soval, and we we shot it in a in a parking lot outside with one. 20 foot by 20 foot green screen <laughs> and I had measured out where the sun was going to move because I wanted the whole thing illuminated by natural light right but we had to make sure the sun stayed behind the shoulders of everyone so we moved the screen and moved the camera all throughout the day <laughs> yeah for every different setup we moved it yeah. so we could and it was it was you know I went and I had already made Tobias Richter who did the visual effects 
we had made a we 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 had meticulously planned how we were going to shoot this scene. Yeah. yeah. But then you and I after that we started working on the feature screenplay because it was never a finished. Well, that was the interesting thing, and, and and the Vulcan scene was you know it was kind of a it was it was a walk and talk right it was kind of an information dump but it was you had said that Gary Graham had told you at the costume fitting that like I don't understand the scene I don't understand the script I don't understand who these people are to each other and what they're saying and you know Gary Graham reprising his role of Saval from Enterprise I was a huge Enterprise fan and so I understood the arc that that character had taken on Enterprise and where he must be you know eighty plus years later at the time of Axanar. And so and, and so I rewrote that scene with all kinds of touchstones from Enterprise built into that scene. And then, you know, then we had, we had a great, it was a great success. That, that shoot was tremendous. It, it, you know, Gary was thrilled. It was, And I had to show him specific, specifically that I could direct and I yeah. could direct something that was, and I, you know, work with Tobias and I had designed that whole sequence because it was right. my idea that it was behind, um, the Vulcan High Command, and what I wanted there was a a sculpture garden, and the sculpture garden was dedicated to logic and right. math mathematics and and all that. And it was really interesting because we had to figure out we had to plot like, okay, where are these sculptures, and how far would it take to walk between them? <laughs> because it was right. an entirely virtual background. And, right, and the crazy thing is when it was done, is obviously it was in Shakar, right, the capital city, and Shakar. And Shakar, right? And Mount Saleh was right there in, on the horizon. And and it, the interesting thing is if is when that scene was done, if you go look at that scene and then you go look at the scene, the scene shot on Vulcan from Star Trek Enterprise, <laughs> our stuff looked way, way better. Yeah. I mean, it, it, just well, looked, it just looked feature film quality almost. Yeah. And our, we finished our stuff at 2K. And it was interesting because that was really the only scene that was finished from the Axanar feature film. Right. And even I was going to go reshoot it. Right. You know, it was funny. It was our lead concept, actress, yeah, our lead actress had strep throat. So my friend Kim Fitzgerald, I literally called her up at like almost midnight. I said, "Can you be right. on set at six a.m. Yeah. to get into makeup?" And you know, we I just we had to do it, and right. it was a lot of fun. And and we'll show one of the great things about. Well, here's the thing. Well, I want to get back to to Picard. Yeah. So you yeah, and yeah, I have yeah. a long history of working in together, yeah. and we we're going to make this Star Trek feature. So we spent years working on this script. Right, absolutely, and, and, and part and part of the effort of working on that script was we were trying to make it part of continuity, part of the actual right. the prime canon. Tie it to Enterprise, tie it to Star Trek VI, tie it to the original series, which means interweaving all kinds of 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 characters and references and stuff. So when I so when we're sitting in the Chinese theater and I saw in the twenty fifth century at the beginning of that, I thought because ours oh started in the twenty third century, right? And I've right. got the because uh, I had developed, you know, I had we had. And you'll see, I'll show it to the people watching now, Yeah, uh, some of the animatics. But I think you and I both were coming from it like we wanted to make a Star Trek techno thriller, a, a Tom Clancy-esque. Right. We always talked about like Hunt for Red October or Crimson Tide. or yeah. and, and I think one of the things that showrunner Terry Metalis and his incredible writing staff did, and this is probably why we both love Picard season three so much, is it is a techno thriller. Yeah, and it, also, it, it, and it's an ensemble. It's a character yes. ensemble. It's yes. a big, lots of characters. And, and every one of those characters gets a meaningful contribution and has a meaningful character arc, right? Like these characters, most of them who we've known for, you know, 25 plus years, 30 years, we see that we pick them up in a different place. They're in a different place in their lives. So we see how they've developed. And then over the course of these episodes, we see how they, they develop even more. And fall back into their old roles from the next generation, but like in new ways. And it's like, it, 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 so what Terry and his writers have have done with this season, which I recognized immediately, is exactly what we were trying to do with Axanar. It's yeah. really grounded in the, in the the history and the the atmosphere and the and, and you know the, the little touches that say, look, this is Star Trek. It, you know, it's interesting because the last you know twenty five plus years, twenty years of, of Star Trek. It's felt very much like every time they they rebooted it or re you know did it went into a new timeline or whatever, they just they pay, played fast and loose with all of the canon, with all of the history of the characters. They retconned all kinds of stuff, and it feels like they just did it so they just didn't have to worry about it. And, right. and it's like you can still make great Star Trek. You just have to show people like, look, 
this sits on a foundation of what came before. It's new and it's fresh and it can be different. And you could go in a new direction, but it has to be, it has to respect what came before. And I think that's what has been missing from Star Trek is that love and that sense that the people making it love and more importantly, respect that lore and the audience, the longtime audience. Well, and that's something I, you know, I've really hated since 2009. It's yeah. to me, and I've always said this, Star Trek is a period piece about a future that never existed. Right. And right. and in, in saying that, it has, like, you, it happened. Like, you need to approach Star Trek as if, and when I say Star Trek, I'm talking the original series, the animated series, the feature films, the next generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. Enterprise. And look, yeah. As people cared less, I mean, I, Brandon Brog and Rick Berman, it's ironic they created the final Star Trek series because neither one of them, you know, would have wanted to have spent as much of their lives doing that. As, so right. Enterprise is not, you know, there's there's always canonical errors. And then we as yeah. fans are left to navigate those waters. But for right. the most part, I think you and I both come at it from this is a this is a immutable history. Yeah. You know, yeah. and 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 yeah. here's the thing. There are things that you can say like like there's a what I really love about what Terry and his writers did is they're not retconning things. It's right. it's different when oh. you change history, but you can add things to stuff that we've already seen right. that we just haven't heard about yet. Or provide provide new context to things we have seen that makes you see them in a different way now. Like that's totally fine, but you still have to respect what we've seen and what we know from the past. Yes, like I there's. Think, I don't think that's hard to do. No, it's I not. I don't think it's hard to do. And no, because it's, you have to look at it as real history, right? You know, yeah. And and the funny thing is, is there's so much, there's so many resources now, especially with Memory Alpha and all the technical manuals or whatever. Yeah, the Puda encyclopedias. Yeah, the, which are essential. You can find out. At the uh, 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 within a few keystrokes, the yeah. answers to any question you have, it's just the people that have been working on Star Trek didn't care, right? And I and think it's, that's it. I, it's like recent Star Trek feels, and I'm talking about the move, the recent movies, the, the Abrams verse movies, Kelvin Timeline, and Discovery, uh, and Strange New Worlds. Movie. Yeah, it, I it mean, they very, bar like, like there's uh, there's a Khan Noonien Singh ancestor and strange new worlds i'm like the they've completely reinvented the gorn and made them stupid they made them xenomorphs from aliens right? yeah and and they you just, look at this and you're like what the fuck yeah 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 and it and it feels very much like a lot of these writers had a very clear idea of what they wanted to do which is they wanted to take star trek but make it into their own thing and and you know they were probably you know it feels like they were assigned okay here are the here are the 30 episodes of all these shows and films that you really need to see, right? And it feels like a lot of them just went and watched like the first 10 and then got bored and then watched Game of Thrones. Right, so right. That's what we want to do. We want to make it more like Game of Thrones, right? And it's like, and it, but it's not hard. It's little things. It's like, for example, Starfleet is a professional space Navy. Right, right? yes. Right? You should never see characters on the Enterprise bridge or on any Starship bridge who are bored, who are like, don't know if they really want to be there. Cracking are, jokes. Right. Who cracking jokes like they're in a Starbucks lounge, right? Like they should be professionals. They should always be acting professional. They should be the best at what they do. Because in Starfleet, as you know, the way the way we've seen Starfleet in the past is, you know, for every every seat on that bridge, there are 50 other people who would love to be there, but who weren't good enough. Right. So you have to be the best of the best. You have to want it to be there. And yeah. you have to earn it. And it's like so so in other words, people when you see these these people on the bridge. They should be professionals, as if you went to an air, you know, a, a modern aircraft carrier in the U.S. Navy and went on the bridge and watched people working. You're not going to see people cracking wise about how great they are and like their troubled childhood and and you know how they're scared of being out in the ocean. It's like that's just not that's just not appropriate. No, and I and I think it's it's very apparent. Like one of the things I really love about, uh, it, it, I think one of the things that people haven't really. Uh, latched onto yet is the bridge crew. You you see them. Yeah. There's cutaways to them, but as the show progresses, you really begin to love 
Yes. This secondary bridge crew. And yeah. they and, all look. By the way, and Captain Shaw as well. And Captain Shaw. No spoilers, you... but, but all of those characters become richer and more nuanced and more interesting as the series season goes on. And and they've all, they've uh, and you'll see particularly like in episode four, you watch what a really crack team of people that really know what they're doing are capable yes. of. Yeah. And yeah. unlike, and Terry was, you know, I didn't know Terry Metalis. You know, I, I we had a few exchanges on Twitter when I was ripping on him. You know, he's like, "This is going to be a good send off for the another send off they never got." I'm like, "What? Dude, all good things wasn't enough for you, dude?" You know, and I didn't know him, and he he wrote right. me back. He was very I, sweet. He was he wrote back. He said, "You know, I really like Free Enterprise." <laughs> but and I, but I wrote like, back to him. I'm like, because I, "Because I think Terry understands. Like, if, if for you know, I get that there are that there's a new audience that's come to Star Trek because of these new shows and." They love it, and I, and I totally appreciate that. That me too, the case. me too. I've always said, as much as I hate Star Trek Discovery, and as much as I've hated Star Trek Picard seasons one and two, yeah, and I, I'm not a fan of Strange New Worlds to be honest, but yeah. um, I'm I'm very aware of the fact that there are new fans every day, and their yeah. first experience of Star Trek is Discovery, is Strange New Worlds, is Picard, right. and I never want those people to ever feel. Like I don't respect their own fandom because it's not no. fair, you right. know. It's it's like I don't get mad at people like Daniel Craig's my favorite James Bond and they've never right. seen the right. Sean right. Connery. That's right. it, that isn't fair. It's a fifty-seven year right. old franchise. But that's the whole point of Star Trek is that there's room for everybody, and you just have to make room for everyone, and you have to just respect everyone. You have to respect the history. You have to respect. You know, you can. I, I, there's so much room for Star Trek to go in new directions. There's right. so much room. You just have to show people that you care about the whole history of the franchise. Well, that's that's what I've been missing since 2009. Yeah. Because there is there is a I think there is a a real smugness to all the people that, you know, when JJ Abrams was on the press tour for Star Trek 09, every interview he talked about how he didn't like Star Trek growing up. Yeah. I'm like, "Why the yeah. fuck did you take the job, dude?" I mean, yeah. I know that no one you, you, you know, after doing Mission Impossible 3, it wasn't your franchise and you took it over right. and it was apparent to me in every frame of everything that J.J. Abrams has ever touched yeah. regarding Star Trek that he didn't like Star Trek. Everything tried to make it, he tried to make it something else. Every right. single shot. Yeah, more Guardians of the Galaxy, more, some more, a little bit more Star Wars touches. And the thing of it is, is it's, you know, I was I was willing to be totally open. And I, there's a lot I love about 2000, that 2009 film. I love the cast and, and Carl Urban is Bones. And it's like, they got so much right, but then they do something like they blow Vulcan up. Right. And then and then and then in the next film, I thought, OK, this is a good place to start. But now I want to see him out in the galaxy exploring. Right. And instead, they remake Star Trek, Two. Badly. And they did it in such really a way badly. That, yeah. And, and you know, they, they cast uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. And then they then they did this whole coy thing where they were like, oh, he's not playing Khan. He's playing John Harrison. And everybody's like, he's playing Khan. No, John Harrison. No, he's totally playing Khan. And sure enough, he's totally playing Khan. And they basically just remake Star Trek, Two, And then in the third film, they. They they blow up the Enterprise as they do in Star Trek Three, and on top of that, you've got they show a Captain Kirk who is bored of being a starship captain. Yeah, it, it's terrible. And it's like in no damn universe are, is James T. Kirk ever going to be bored of being a starship captain. That's the very essence of the character, and it's like that. It's just too much. Like I'll give you a couple of things. I'll give you a couple retcons even. But when it's when it's big ones, one after the other, after the other, after the other. It just tells me that you don't care. You just don't care about that stuff. Well, and that's why I love, I mean, you know, as this season unfolds, mm -hmm. what I love about this season, ultimately, it really is a show, like all great drama, yeah. about relationships between people. Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, in this episode, uh, obviously, we're going to get into spoiler territory, I, I think right. that would be... But you know, at the end of this for episode, episode, for episode two only, for yeah, for, for episode two, or we're only going to talk about just episode dropped two. last night. Yeah, um, the exchange between Beverly when Riker brings her to the bridge and Picard at the end of the episode, a wordless exchange. Yeah, everything yeah. you need to know, you know, is there. Yeah, and and I think what's really interesting about and as you, as the show progresses, both Todd Stashwick as Liam Shaw and Ed Spilliers as Jack Crusher. I think are revelations in terms of characters and additions to the Star Trek canon. Oh, I mean, you know, I'm I'm reading people talking about oh, Ed Spilliers is like a bargain basement 
Han Solo, but he's not that at all. No. I mean, and I, I really love the thought, the idea that, I mean, we're not, we don't really know why, but Beverly Crusher hasn't told, uh, she hasn't talked to her shipmates in 20 years, and we, we it, it does uh, pay off. You, you understand now yeah. that we know that the parentage is Picard and Crusher. And, and look, everybody knew that. Riker's like, come on, aren't we going to talk about the elephant in the yeah, room? Even in, even in the first episode, he was like, wait. Yeah, I mean, uh, come on, man. Yeah. So, and, yeah. and while, you know, a lot of people are going to say that, that, Picard season three has a lot of quote unquote Star Trek's greatest hits because you know Kirk and David Marcus, right? But but the thing about it is is that when you hear Beverly does have this great conversation, uh, you you, you know her and Picard obviously will talk, right. and and we right. do understand the motivations, and it's really uh it's very next generation centric, yeah. And the idea yeah. that people have offspring is not. You know, and in this show, I think Terry Metalis and his writers, what we leave to the next generation and and what we pass down to people, our loved ones, our offspring, is very much uh, at the heart of what this season is about, Yes, ultimately. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we've seen people like, well, you know, Jordy's Sydney LaForge is just like Demora Sulu. Well, the idea that military families, I mean, it used to be, now everyone's talking about nepo babies, but I yeah. mean, when I was yeah. growing up, there were I had I knew friends that their whole family had been in the military, right? You know, grandfathers, fathers, sons. So the fact that LaForge has two, we know he has two daughters, and uh, his his we haven't met his second daughter yet, but she's actually played by Lavar Lavar Burton's uh, real daughter, but yeah. Miss Chestnut, who plays Sydney LaForge. First of all, how cute is she? And, yeah. and and she's how great, great! How great is it to see them on screen together, right? Oh. And, and the two actresses that play sisters are so good. I mean, it's they're that's so the good, is, so that's good. The thing is, everything that you see on on this season is driven by character. It's driven by character and character action, and and we're we're picking up unresolved story threads and unresolved character plot lines from twenty five years ago, and we're seeing where they've gone and bringing them all back together again. So to me, that's the revelation about this, this whole season is that it is so character driven. Uh, you know, there's obviously a threat and, and they're, 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 you know, the characters react to that, but it, but to see these people who they've become and who they're still in the process of becoming before and will become before the end of the season is lovely, is really lovely. And it's refreshing. And I, and I, and, and everybody's at the top of their game in terms of acting. Well, you know, it's funny because I haven't seen anyone mention this, but you know the, they they now have the Star Trek universe logo that's at the beginning of all their shows. Yeah, if you look at this second episode, if you go back and you watch the beginning when you see that the, now it's the Titan, it comes by. Right, you can see the Shrike in the nebula <laughs> of the logo of when it comes. Right. I mean, so <laughs> so so Terry Terry Metalis as a showrunner. Like he didn't have to do that. No, you that's know, the he, amazing uh, thing is the attention to detail that Terry did, the writers, Dave Blass, the Akutas, all the people they brought on board. Uh, they brought well, back to Star Trek. Uh, yeah. we, we, you know, we we see, of course, Worf is introduced. What we find out, Worf is Rafi's handler in this episode, oh. and Terry Metalis, you know, went back to Dan Curry, the man who designed the Batleth, right? You know, who was a, a visual effects supervisor, one of two on Next Generation. And asked him to design a new Klingon weapon, which is the Kurleth. That's a bigger version of the Mechleth we saw Worf wield in First Contact. Right. You know, when he puts it on his back. I mean, who would have done that? No, I know. I like, know. You know, it, it, Terry Metalis went and did that. You know, <laughs> yeah. he went and called. And, he didn't have to do that. Like, little things like in that first episode when they're the, when they're in, in the at Guinan's. And all the, all the little ships are there. The little replica ships, right? Which is the Eagle Moss. Sure. Ships. There's like there's the Franz Joseph Dreadnought from from the Star Trek technical manual. That's right. a little thing, but it's the kind of thing that tells a, a longtime fan, okay, the people who are making this really, really deeply get it. Well, it's interesting too that you know the whole they talk about the navigational the um, the the uh, computer virus that was in the navigational systems of the Enterprise. I mean, they allude right. to things like this, so that was something they added. Yeah. And and yeah, because yet, we never actually saw that on the original. On no, the original. but here's the thing: I'm sure there's a thousand people on the Enterprise D. Yeah. They're all having problems on the Borg. We we've only ever seen. I was talking about this in the first episode. We've only ever seen the command crew, 
But right. what about the thousand other people on the ship when they're fighting the Borg? The Borg were probably right. trying to penetrate the ship in hundreds of different ways. We yeah. just haven't seen it. So right. what Terry and his writers have done, they've thought about things like, okay, this, while we haven't heard about it before, it doesn't. it's not a retcon. It's no. just additional no. information that works really well. And I'm like, yeah. that's really interesting. And I don't want to spoil anything, but there's something about, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about the, the holodeck. Yeah, yeah. I won't, there is an interesting, uh, for as many holodeck episodes, as much as that was a crutch, there's a really interesting added element yes. to the yeah. holodeck that I was like, wow, yeah. that's yeah. Yeah, really I, interesting. Something new that Terry right. and his writers, and you know, when you hear it, you're like, of course, right. of course that's what it is. That's really... Yeah. And by the way, this is not a big plot point. It's just an no, extra added no. detail. And when these you hear just, it, like... These are just signs that Terry just... Like, Terry and his writers know. They, like, you can't do that unless you know this material well. Unless you know the history. Unless you know the characters. It's the kind of thing that... It, it, it enhances our knowledge of, of what we've seen before. Without changing it. Without retconning it. Without, like, you know, making it all invalid. It makes us look at that stuff in a different way now. That is perfectly in keeping with... with it's exactly what it should be. It well, feels authentic. Yeah, it's the spirit. I mean, the, yeah. the character interactions. I mean, it's funny because people think that Liam Shaw has it out for our characters, and I'm sure, I'm sure, knowing Terry's writing staff, well, I can. I, we will learn that will unfold. Yes, that relationship, yeah. and and I really love. First of all, Todd Stashwick is such a great actor. He's so and, good. He just kills it. He kills it in this episode, and he kills it in the whole season, man. He really does. he kills it. And and what's he's also a a big fucking nerd. Yeah, I mean that yeah. guy. Like I've met people in the course of seeing this show yeah. that I wouldn't have thought like uber people, high ranking people in Hollywood that are just uber admiral level Star Trek nerds yeah. that I yeah. would not have known. Yeah, and and I I'm I'm seeing a generational schism. The older Star Trek crowd is loving this. Yeah. Because they're seeing the relationships and the characters and, and, and you know, there's, there's, so that's been very interesting to see. But like Stashwick, he's, he's, poor, he, first of all, you know, he has a comedy background. You know, right. he did improv comedy. Yeah. And if and you look at it. He's done a ton of TV stuff. To, yeah, he's been oh. on every different, he's done movies yeah. and TV. I mean, he's one of those. He's one of those actors. He's a great actor. He was he worked with Terry Metalis on Twelve Monkeys. Right. I mean, he, I'm surprised he's not one of these guys that had a show like CSI that he was on for like ten seasons. Right. Right. And right. I, I think that I think that this is either going to get him a lot more movie roles, yeah, or TV roles because first of all, he's a really nice guy, but man, he's an uber D and D Star Trek. He's a geek. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and well, I saw last week's episode. I saw just the. Just the stuff behind him, right? And like the stuff we all have behind us. You know, yeah. it's it's years of it's decades oh. of of love of of genre and pop culture. But his dialogue when he's like, you know, you know, your Kentucky mash, you know, yeah, bebop yeah. ways. Lucy, I had Lucy, to, Lucy, bebop, your Lucy mash, Goosey uh, Kentucky mash. I had to purge your <laughs> out of the I mean, yeah. he's so uh, every single line reading and, and you know what? Ed Spleers too. Yeah. I mean, obviously you're not supposed to like Ed Spilliers right away, right? You know, and but if you look at his, um, uh, his, uh, uh, you you really come to love him. But I think you can yeah. see he's also a great actor. Yeah, yeah. and both. Well, and I, I love the fact that Terry. Here's where you know you're in the hands of of great writers and great showrunners. They introduce characters that they know people are either not going to like or are going to be right. a problem. Right. And, and, they win and, you, and they win you over. And they win you over. Yeah, that's good it's, drama. That's it, good yeah. storytelling. It's very much. It's very much like what uh, Dave Filoni and, and company did with Ahsoka Tano, right? Right. They made that character really, really unlikable at first, and then that the character redeemed herself. And and it's and they they, they they I mean and that's that's what you know that's what character is. That's what human beings are. Human beings are imperfect. They have to learn. They have to overcome the challenges they've had, like all of us, right? And and I love that the writing allows these characters to do that. It allows the characters to be at their best, but we also see them overcoming their worst. Well, I think that's the great joy of this show. What I take yeah. away from Picard and people are like, it's funny because all the people are, 
look, dude, I went out on a limb. I put all my Star Trek credibility. I was all in uh, World yes. Series of Poker, you know. But but it, it, and to me, uh, even Terry, yeah, didn't know what he'd created. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's like, really, is it that good? I'm like, dude, it's well, that good. Here's the thing, like as I was saying, like I, you know, when we were sitting in that theater watching the first two episodes, like I, you know, instantly there are little oh, and clues, you and little you hadn't clues. seen it, you hadn't seen any of it. No, when we went into the premiere, I hadn't seen anything. So there were little tells and like, you know, the little, the music, the score cues from the films and the, in the, in the past series and stuff all throughout. And it's like, okay, this really, oh my God, this really feels like Star Trek. And I'm really digging this and I'm really finding it interesting. And then an episode ends and you go, but it's like, I just don't know if I can trust it yet because of all the stuff that's come before. Right. It's like, you just don't feel like, you know, is this a bait and switch? Like, is this going to be a bait and switch? And, and then I saw the second episode. And it's like, oh my God, it's even better. And then, you know, then as you said, like I was, I was given press access to watch more. So I, I've seen the first six now, and I immediately, when that happened, spent that whole rest of the day like watching the next four episodes. And episode after episode, it gets better, it gets more compelling, it's more more interesting. And I'll tell you, it was it was episode four. Once oh, I seen episode four, when I, when I saw episode four, that is when I knew. This is really the real deal. It's not going to stop being the real deal. It's authentic. It that episode made, made me really, really. I'm not. There's no spoilers, but it made me really, really emotional. Dude, in, it, in oh no, way. everyone's going to get emotional for episode yeah. four. And yeah. and you know what, what's really interesting to me is is again, this is a ten hour movie. Yes. Episodes yeah. one through four are Act yeah. One, very distinctly Act One. Right. Episodes five through eight is act two right and episodes nine and ten are the fucking balls to the wall pedal to the metal uh -huh. you will fucking have uh -huh. your eyes blown out of your uh your head yeah i mean i guarantee anyone who's a next generation fan the beginning of episode nine you will be crying you will be <laughs> oh, no, no, no. you'll you'll and you'll you will have yeah. tears you'll you'll sit there and and people are going to be like they're just because i said this right now everyone's going to start watching episode nine with their hands crossed, like, okay, <laughs> right. okay, Burnett, yes. what, 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 what am I, what, 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 what why am yeah. I going to get teary eyed? Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll listen. I give I'll you say, ninety you seconds. Me, you told me that there was an episode in the first half of the season that was going to make you was like, he goes, oh, dude, I had tears, I, like I, I welled up. You, you told me that, and I was like, and I, okay, okay, all right, that's that's a high bar, but like, all right, and I'd forgot, and I forgot it, and then when it happened, I'm sitting here in my office watching these episodes. <laughs> And my wife comes in, and I'm just like tears streaming down my face. And my wife she goes, "Are you all right?" It's like it's so good. Oh my god, Star Trek's back. It's well, because back. you don't, you don't know right. It, what's really interesting is this is not mystery box storytelling. This is yeah, a thriller. Exactly. This right. is a techno thriller. Right. With mystery boxes, it, it's like they don't reveal things to you because they, they don't even know what the mystery is in the box. Right, 100. percent And also, and also, too often when you have a puzzler like that. They tip their hand, right? They tip their hand, and so the audience, rather than appreciating the character stuff, rather than appreciating the drama organically, you're always on the lookout for, okay, what is the twist? What's the thing going to be? It's the M. Night Shyamalan curse, right? Right. And and what's great about this is you, there's a lot that happens in this episode. You, in these episodes, you just don't see coming because you can't. But once you see it, 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 it it's like, oh, yes, that's exactly the right. That's exactly right. Well, it, it, it's funny. Do, man. That's hard to do. It's, it's funny. I want to. I want to throw some stuff up. Like one of the things. First of all, I want to talk about Amanda Plummer. Yo, as yes. Vatic, Captain yes. Vatic, and yes. and her ship, her ship, uh, the Shrike. And um, let me just put this up so you can see what I'm showing. And how great uh, is it that she's Christopher Plummer's daughter? Oh, like I'm I mean, constant as the morning that. star. You know, <laughs> right? So. Havoc! Uh, yeah, so here we go. Here's some uh, pictures. Here's the Shrike, uh, the Shrike exterior. And um, uh, truth be told, I stole these off Doug Drexler's Facebook page today. Um, and uh, here's another angle. And what's very interesting is um, here is an underneath angle where you can see what some people think is a deflector dish. But if you watched the... Um, episode there's weapons on the ship they don't know what it is right and right. we've had indications that there was a weapon used obviously in episode one there was a 
a portal portal weapon used. Just saying, you know. Right. Yeah, we'll we'll see. Maybe maybe the right. ship we're gonna, has. We're going to see that ship's got a lot of tricks up its sleeve. Let's yeah, it's got that. a lot of tricks up its sleeve. But <laughs> now, what did, what did you think of Amanda Plummer as Vatic, Captain? Oh, Vatic. I thought she's great, and I think she's she's completely unexpected. She's kind of just delightfully weird, and yeah. not the villain you expect. And and, and by the way, there's a reason she's on. delightfully weird too, and we'll see. But but yeah, I agree. I mean, I love that she's smoking. You know, and and I, it's funny because there's there's a lot of people that are like, well, I can't get past the fact, like on on Metallus, they're smoking or they're doing drugs or whatever, and it's like that planet was established in in Enterprise as being yes. one of the worst planets yeah. in the, you know, it's outside and, the Federa- it's outside Federation space and, yeah. and things like that. And look, there, you know, we've talked about this before. I, the idea that like, look, Utopia is not possible. A perfect utopia that lasts forever is not, it's just not possible. The law of the, the humanity, you know, just the nature of humans and human society and, and conflict and just the, the, the laws of entropy, just, you know, just, the, you know, don't allow for, for, for a utopia that's going to last forever. But the idea is to keep striving for that, right? Even yeah. though you'll never, you'll never perfectly achieve it. So the idea that you were seeing, we're seeing human beings who aren't perfect human beings who have drug issues or smoking or whatever that are not perfect. That's, there are always going to be those people. It's just, it's just, it's just natural. But you know, in the Federation, the idea is that they figured out most of their problems. They're not perfect. They haven't got it all figured out, but they've certainly made a more egalitarian, more, more um, equal society where people just don't fall through the cracks as much. Right. And people have the potential to reach their full potential in, in a way Regardless, you know, regard who, where you come from, what your background is, race, color, it, you know, species, sexual orientation. Right. Like, are you an android or synthetic or human or whatever? It doesn't matter. And that's that's right at the heart of what Star Trek is. But, you know, but it's not ever going to be perfect. And you're never going to see perfect human beings. That's that's the key thing to keep in mind. Well, here's an interesting. So John Miller sends in a super chat and says he's disappointed with season three so far. Does it get better? Are the first two episodes representative of the whole season? If so, I think I'll be checking out. Now, I have to say, you know, I've been taking a lot of flack from certain yeah. quarters about loving the show. Right. And and having seen the whole thing, as I've said, I've tried to explain to people, as I said to you, it's a 10-hour Star Trek movie. Right. Or it's a 10-hour Star Trek novel. And I can yes. understand why a lot of people like, you know, the character of Rafi a lot of people don't dig her storyline but again her storyline uh dovetails i mean what she's after and you see that it her child her ex-husband right. her storyline and what's going on in her life personally mirrors a lot of what's going on through uh when riker says i think deanna and kestra will be happy to get rid of me right in the first right. episode yes if you're paying attention all of this stuff is all interwoven into the story. And there's and, a and the various storylines, the various story threads kind of reinforce each other. Yes. In ways that you don't expect. And I, and what I what I would say to anybody who's like, you know, well, I don't know, I don't know, it still hasn't buy-in. Just keep just stick with it, man, because I'm telling you, it gets better and better. I felt the same way when I when I started watching. I really liked it, but like I wasn't hundred percent sold. But you just you haven't seen anything yet. Like you two episodes in you haven't seen anything yet there's a lot more to come a lot yeah more. but but what's really interesting and it's something that when i when i was first watching this so i've watched the entire season all the way through three times yeah and the first time you're watching it i'm just like trying to take it all in right 100%. and and there was one point and i'll say it was in episode five where i was like i can't i can't believe what i'm seeing. i know Yes, I I, yeah. I I was like I can't believe this. I I it, it was so, I didn't even know I wanted this, but I'm right. like wow I've waited 30 years for this. Yeah, literally yeah. 30 years for this. I did, and I didn't know how much I wanted it. And when it happens, yeah. it was so good. And when yeah. I say that to people, it's not like the fucking red wedding in Game of Thrones. It's no, not no. like this, that. This show earn, let, let, the a way to put it. I think is this show really does earn its moments. It really does earn its moments. And, and there are lots of moments. There are lots of moments th- th- of various kinds for the characters, for, you know, longtime fans, for, 
you know, it, 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 I mean, I, I just, I would say keep the faith, man. I mean, I, I get it. Uh, the last, the last, you know, 20 years of Star Trek have been tough for longtime Star Trek fans. It's been because tough. It, you know, my problem with the last, to be honest, since 2009, I don't believe the characters. Right. And my problem with the first two seasons of Picard and Discovery, but especially Picard, we all know who Jean-Luc Picard is. Right. In seasons one and two of Jean uh, of Picard, he didn't feel like Jean-Luc Picard. No. It was Patrick Stewart, you know, d dealing with whatever. And the, the, I understand yeah. they had to. But that's, I think, the thing that, that Terry Metalis did that might be the greatest thing he did was he just he was able to convince Patrick Stewart and the powers that be and Alex Kurtzman and, and right. Akiva Goldsman, you know, they were all off doing their own thing. So maybe they, he had extra added leverage there, right? but he was able to convince Patrick Stewart to play the character that people know and love. And you see Jean-Luc Picard become Jean-Luc Picard in this second episode. Yeah. You know, yeah. he goes through the whole thing. He sits down, he's having, I love the conversation he had with Ed Spaliers, you know, yeah. when he's asking these questions and when he sees Beverly and he finally takes charge and it's, you know, engage. Right. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, the episode's called Dis uh, Disengage, but by the end of this episode, no, we have, we, it's taken three seasons. Yeah. Yeah. And also, Jean Luc Picard, you know, Captain Picard, call right. him Admiral if you want, but engage. He's right. back, and they spent, if you really look at what's going on in those first two episodes, that's where we've now we've now reestablished. Now, let me ask you this, because everyone everyone's always, I can't, it's so stupid. It's like people sending me the Simpsons meme, man shouts at clouds. Yeah, like no one's ever said that before. Right. How do you feel about the fact that Picard is in a synth synthetic body? Does this bother uh, you? No. Because because if you hadn't watched season one and two of of uh, Picard, you wouldn't even know. I mean, it's not even really an. It, it doesn't even feel well, like it's an issue. It's it's it's. No, I don't care honestly. And so, it, well, the funny thing is, synthetic bodies and android bodies have been a part of Star Trek since the original series in the first yeah. season. Yeah, but what and, I find and really granted as a writer, it's not a choice I would have made, or if I was going to no, do it. No, it's monumentally I, it, it, stupid. It felt so arbitrary. It just felt so arbitrary. But then but, you have Amanda Plummer makes the joke, you know, Vatic says right. Synth synthetic flesh. Right. We're done. We're over. It's it's right. you're done with with that. You don't have to so right. so uh that that happened and yeah, I look yeah. at it this way. The synthetic body that is based on technology, Noonien Sung's technology, it's basically a wheelchair for Picard's soul. Yeah, and, <laughs> it's and just I think a the way I think of it. The way I think yeah. of it is is it, whereas Data was an android these synthetic bodies are more like um, they're more like replicants from, yeah. from Blade Runner. They're human. They, they are human human bodies. In, in you know, for all practical purposes, in, in many ways, right? It's it, so it's so it's 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 an interesting sort of hybrid of of uh, and I mean, look, it's it, it, it's it's basically just a, a storytelling detail. To me, it's just it's not. It's well, and, and look, thing. Terry was saddled with this. Some of his writers yeah. were saddled yeah. with it. What, what was a, a very stupid. I mean, the idea that you're going to get an android body, like like what would have been interesting if, if they knew this before, you could have transported or you could have, when Picard wakes up, he's in the body of Ed Spaliers, if you wanted to do that in season one. Right. And suddenly Picard right. is Ed Spaliers. You know, that, that would have been, people yeah. would have, it, 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 they, I think they would have uh, appreciated that more. Because right. why would you build somebody who's old, an exact android du right. duplicate? It's all so stupid. Yeah, it doesn't like it doesn't all of modern lot, Star Trek, but it's like that was that's the nature of season one and season two and a lot of discovery. It just doesn't make a logical, lot of logical sense. So but whatever. But, I mean, you can put it out Cap of your mind. Yeah, easily. but Captain Vatic, I want to get back to her. I mean, yeah. first of all, I think she's relishing what she's doing. She's a little weird and odd, and I don't yeah. know if I remember correctly. She also has a great backstory. Like when you find out. Her origin, it's right. fucking mind blowing. You're yeah. like, oh my yeah. god! And, and well, that's and that's what what I love about what I'm seeing. Even with all these new characters and the new situations, thought, there's a lot of thought put into it. It's they're not just doing things arbitrarily. There's no. a there's a lot of thought to everything you see and everything the characters say and to every action they take. It's not. It is just not random retcon, arbitrary stuff. 
it it feels you know it 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 all feels organic when you get when you when you see more of it it makes it all starts to make a lot more more it it feels it just feels more natural for more organic more authentic the more you watch yeah i mean and, and I, again what i love about this is you know having having now met terry and talked to him you know he's a big fan of of like first contact and yeah. I, I i was not so much a big fan of first contact but i understand appreciate why he loves first contact sure but but his writers they've really thought about all of this yes and yeah. you know meeting yeah. meeting a vatic and and it was something that uh, terry actually told me that when sh- when amanda Plummer was actually shooting everybody was so having so much fun watching her doing what she did because in real life she smokes and she brought yeah. that into the character and right. you know i've heard people say well i don't like the fact people smoke and i'm like okay i i, I don't care about that i mean it's I mean, but- here's the thing if, if you get if you're getting hung up on details like that i think you're not watching with an open heart or an open mind you, you, you know if, if, if you're looking for things to dislike well, i think that's i think that's a problem in fandom in general people today they decide what they like and what they don't before they even see the film based on the trailers and based on what they heard about what people were doing behind the scenes. Uh, and I think you have to go into it with an open mind. But I would say it's never, I'll, I'll say this. It's, it's never, it doesn't come up in the story, like why no. she smokes. But if you really think about it, I love the fact that she does smoke because there are certain, you know, character traits uh, about her Right. That would make me believe that there there's an actual very good reason. Like sure. she enjoys smoking. Right. <laughs> and if you think about it, when the show's over and you think about it to yourself, like why was she smoking? You'd be like, oh, that's interesting that she. Right. I, and I love that. That's a great character. Look, I think everybody should smoke in movies because smoking looks cool. When I see Rachel, I mean, every cinematographer <laughs> loves smoke in the air, but. You know, but I do think like people are arguing. I'm seeing on my Twitter feed, why is she cock? Why is uh uh why are they cocking their phaser rifles? And I'm like, who's to say that? I mean, they're out on the frontier. Who's to yeah. say that they're it, all all of those things? And I'm a canonista. Yeah, and I totally understand. But yeah, yeah. What I what 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 I'm more interested in, why I love this season so much, is the relationships. Hundred percent, and I think that's hundred percent. The relationships and the way we see these characters develop, become, you know, we get back in touch with who they were, reveal who they are now, how they all come together to be kind of something new. And I love the way the new characters. It's not just the old characters. It's no, it's the new characters too. You know, kind of, they all sort of rise to the occasion in a way that is. That I think is I think that's what good Star Trek should should do. It should be about it should be about you know th- these people together doing what they do, being at their best, empower each other to be their best, and and all of these characters in this season really get the chance to do that. And I think that's at the heart of what Star Trek should be. Yeah, honestly. Well, I mean, to me, that's one of the things I've hated about modern Star Trek is it celebrates mediocrity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and. Yeah, and- yeah. The, the, it the feels thing like that... when, you, when we have characters on the Enterprise bridge that are bored or scared or don't really like, you know, don't that aren't that don't look like they would even have passed a Starfleet psych exam, much less get assigned to a starship. Right. Like, I, you know, it, it's it, it is. I mean, I get that it's some of this stuff is being done to sort of uh, to, to 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 appeal to modern sensibilities. And, and and a lot of it, a lot of it is is very direct commentary on what has been very direct commentary on what's going on in society today. But I think, you know, the whole point of Star Trek is that it's supposed to show a vision of a future where we've solved a lot of those petty problems and in yeah. and, and a vision of a future that we actually all want to be a part of, not a dark, depressing place where everybody is, you know, everybody is insecure. And, you know, it, I, I think it's supposed to be, in, you know, inspiring. And, I, and, and that's what's been missing, I think, for me. Well, and, and one of the things, too, I love about, and it's very subtle, and I don't think it's very overt, but you see the, again, going back to the bridge crew on the Titan, yeah, all of those people really belong there. And you, yeah, you come, it, with all the cutaways, you come to love these people, and you realize yeah. they're really good at their jobs. Yeah. And I, yes. I think that what's happened in modern society is we want to, <laughs> 
we've made it so people that aren't good at their jobs should be made to feel comfortable and like no it's okay it's okay right. and i'm like why are we doing this why 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 are we yeah. not pushing people to me when i was a kid and i was watching star trek one of the things that made me love it is i wanted to one day grow up and be worthy yeah. of those people yeah right like exactly. and that i understood it took work and it was it's a like, lifetime me, of work. To me, Star Trek is like I, I'll never forget. I, you know, in the '90s, I went to I went. I've been a fan of space flight my entire life, and I went to NASA, and I saw the John Glenn Space Shuttle launch, and I got to his media. I got to go behind the scenes and meet all kinds of astronauts and stuff. And when you were in that environment, it was at the Kennedy Space Center. We we had to stay at the Space Center the night before the launch because they said there's going to be so many people out there on the causeway that if you leave, you might not get back, get back in. So you're welcome to just stay here all night long. And so we just parked a car and we slept in the car and I'm laying there at like 2 a.m. You know, right next to the VAB, the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center when it's all illuminated with the big NASA logo. And I'm laying there in bed, trying or laying there in the car, the driver's seat, trying to sleep. And I look and I look around and it's like, why am I sleeping? Like, this is amazing. And I just got out and soaked in the environment. And there's like the space shuttle on, on the horizon all lit up with the xenon lights and, and, all, and people are, are working and buzzing around and everybody's excited. And we, we, my wife and I went to the commissary right behind the, the launch control center and all the NASA employees are in there. And the, you, the, you walked in that room and it's like you could feel the energy. You could feel the energy. You could cut it with a knife. You, it was it was ele- the whole place was electric. Everybody was just buzzing because everybody's excited and everybody's 100 percent, 110 percent committed to the mission to what they're doing everybody's thinking did i do everything right is there anything i missed and and you realize all of that human positive human energy is being applied to this magnificent thing of sending human beings into space and then when you see it you realize that this this isn't a natural thing this just doesn't happen people have to work really really hard and be the best at what they are in order to make something like that even remotely possible and that's, by the way, that's, and that Star Trek touches right into that. That's the whole idea. Hundred percent, absolutely. Somebody, uh, uh, stop. George says, "How does Jack Crusher have an English accent?" They address it. <laughs> they do. Don't address you it. worry. Hundred percent address it. They Don't you worry. Yep, Everything absolutely. that you're wondering as yes. a Star Trek fan, I mean, everyone's yeah. like, "Well, what about that? Or what about this?" Keep watching. Keep, Keep watching. watching. Uh, I get it. I get it. It's been I do to too. Discuss. And as a canonista, I mean, look, they don't necessarily address why anyone's cocking their phaser rifles. No, you know, in my mind, in my mind, you're doing something to actually up the your uh, rather than a, a Star Trek Type Two phaser from the original series. You actually have a dial that you have to turn right. to change the settings. Maybe right. cocking it changes the settings instantaneously. Right. Uh, and by the way, who's to say that Starfleet issue? Yeah, right. A, that's, that's, we that's, saw at the beginning true. of this episode that yeah. they're they're doctors without borders. They right. are trading with all kinds of people. Who knows what modifications they have? But, but and, you you see all the details they got right. Just a little thing of like like at the very in the very first episode where they're talking about Frontier Day, which celebrates the 250th anniversary of Starfleet, is is a callback to this. Yes, it it's is. Callback to the launch of the Enterprise from from Star Trek Enterprise, the NX01. The launch of this starship in that first episode of Enterprise was the start of Starfleet, and that is what they're celebrating it here 250 years later. It's like little touches like that that are like, oh, that's that's exactly and and we right. know we know in episode one, and one of my favorite things is Picard. Uh, th- here's what I love about the show. Yeah, when when Picard first meets Riker in the bar. Riker's like, yeah, I got to give this speech at Frontier Day and whatever. And Picard's like, well, I have to give one too. And he's like, well, yours will be great. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. It's, who, I wants mean to, who wants to hear a, hear a bunch of old guys talk about f- flying through space? And then, yeah. Then, yeah, right. I mean, oh, that's great. Good. That's great writing. That's yes. That's what I loved. I mean, I key yeah. into the character stuff. Yeah, 100%. And, and I, there's it, so it was, much. There's so much of it. That's every every episode, every scene of every episode. There's little details like that that just that are surprising, that are rewarding, that are unexpected, that are that make perfect sense. The, it's just it's just so good. And by the way, just from a sheer point of like you know the, watching the visual effects, how great is it that they're that they're that these battles that are happening aren't happening oh. on the space the space lake? Oh, you should. T- 
I would love you define for me and, and our viewers right now that are watching, Bill, what is the space lake? <laughs> it's it's the whole idea, and, and a perfect example of it is the meeting of the Enterprise and the Reliant in Star Trek II, right? Space is infinite. You can go in any any direction. Like The X, Y, Z axis. Right, X, Y, Z. Some planets are up here. Some planets are down here. Some planets are over here, right? And so when you meet up with another ship, you're not just going to come right at each other on the exact same plane always, right? It's just not always going to be like that. And if you're having a battle, it's not going to be a battle like you would see like in the movie Midway, for example, with a real Navy where everybody's on, they're on a flat surface. and They're, they're on the ocean, move, the lake. The ocean, and they can move on that two-dimensional surface, but the ships can't go up, they can't go down, right? But in space, you can you can do that. You can spin and twist and go in all As, as Spock said about Khan, his pattern indicates two-dimensional thinking. Which they use to very good effect in the Mutar Nebula at the end of that, right at the end of that film. And it's, but yet, every, so often we see that. That's what they're doing. And it's, so it's great to see ships that are, twirling and spinning and, and using the full range of, of motion that for maneuvering in, in, in Star Trek. I mean, it's, I mean, it's stuff like that. It's so refreshing. It's the kind of thing that, that, you know, that, that, that we were trying to do with Axanar is you see ships that are, you know, that are kind of moving and the perspectives are shifting. And, and well, it's speaking, just, it's, speaking about that, I, 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 uh, I have a little surprise <laughs> um uh we, we what one of the things I told you when you were at the premiere I said in the second episode there's something you're going to find particularly amusing. <laughs> yes. Because because and I I I I did get it here to to show. So when we were working on the Axonar feature film, we inherited a script that was never finished. Right. And I I and I, I again, I, I profusely apologize that I threw you into it, and I made you <laughs> over. I mean, we spent ye literally years, yeah, yeah years yeah. rewriting and rewriting the script. And I thought what you had created, you were sending me. It, it I would have loved to have made that movie. I'm really proud of that. I mean, as as I've said before, like that story is not the story I would have told if I'd had like carte blanche to just write yeah. any Star Trek story. We we, we, we inherited it. Right. But to take that existing sort of outline of a story and to make it into a fully realized script with character arcs and reasoning behind everything you see and stuff was uh, was a lot of fun. I'm really proud of that. And we, we did most of that work. The, the heavy lifting was done in like a month. So <laughs> and then we did a lot at, well, over years. We refined and did more. But we there's some good stuff that we were intending to do in Axonar. That and. Is, one of my favorite, one of my favorite things when I watched, and and again, I I I didn't say this to to Terry Metalis, but when I saw episode two, <laughs> where Vatic throws the Elios, the Elios at 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 the Titan, right? I I I, I honestly was shocked. Yeah. I I I, I was yeah. like, now I was only shocked because. Well, why don't you explain why why was I shocked by that, okay, Bill? Okay, well, so so it, when I was brought on board Axonar, in the script there was a scene where the, the a starship, the Ares, USS Ares, is engaged with a bunch of Klingon uh, warships, D sixes. So, yeah, two two D sixes. Right, and, battling, and there's a battle ongoing, and and the Ares uh, fires its torpedoes at one of these D sixes, <laughs> breaks through its shields, and then uses its phasers to cut off one of the warp nacelles. Yeah. on the D6. And then as it's flying past, it uses a tractor beam to grab that that nacelle and drag it along toward one of the up uh, the other D6 and it flings the uses the tractor beam to fling the nacelle piece yeah. at the other ship and then and then in the script as it was when I came on board, Ares fired a torpedo at the nacelle, blowing up the nacelle and the explosion thus blew up, blew up the other D6. And so as I, when I was rewriting, I thought, okay, that's kind of cool. And I, but I rewrote it so that like they took that nacelle and they just whipped it right into the D6's bridge, smashed right through its shields and just absolutely smashed right into the D6, blew up the D6. And then the whole idea is that it's it's leaking drive plasma the whole way. Yeah. So the explosion of the D6 sparks like a fuse down that trail and blows up the, the, the first one as well. And so and so I love this so much. And I'm like, I, I couldn't get past it. I'm like, I was like a little kid in a candy store. Yeah. And so what we were doing on this fan film was 
uh, I was directing the visual effects sequences. Yeah. And uh, what I wanted to do was get all the ship visual, the exterior ship shots done first. Mm -hmm. And then we would caress all the live action shots so you could do a, a camera pan across and then continue the pan on the interior of a ship and right. out. Right. So well, we actually spent time rewriting some scenes to accommodate that. Like, we oh, yeah. Really, there was so much planning going on all throughout that stuff. And you ended up finishing something what like 20 minutes of visual effects i mean I a did. lot of the visual effects for the entire first half of the film were yeah finished. so so i don't know you want to hang out i mean i know you have to get going but you i have a, a few more minutes to i finish. have an eight minute sequence that so people are going to be like and only because i only say this i'm only going to say this doing this because when i first saw that sequence where the elias was thrown at the titan yeah i was like I, I I was like, oh my god, it was so it was so satisfying because yeah. I never got to see what yeah. you and I had cooked up. So well, it's like the idea of using the tractor beam as a weapon. Of course you would. Like, why wouldn't you? It's it's makes perfect sense. Yeah, and and so for those of you, this might seem a little weird, but for those of you, so this is this is Bill Hunt and I, and also Tobias Richter in Germany Tobias and his Richter. company, The Lightworks. This is a sequence, and by the way, you can see what Bill Hunt and I were cooking up. Um, if you look on my uh, on the YouTube channel you're on right now, look up Axonar Origins, parts one, two, and three. This is an excerpt from Axonar Origins, part three. And this is what Bill and I were cooking up. And now, I think the sound is going to be low on this. It's just me talking. But Okay, we could, yeah. Here you go. Well, listen, really cool that we haven't seen before. And again, all of these special effect shots, by doing them first, we would be able to design really, really cool live action shots where we're going in and out of the effect sequence to our live action footage and really make everything dynamic and make these, these moves continue into the live action footage and whip the cameras around and just make it really, really dynamic. But still everything would have a flow to it and it would have a, an elegance to it. There's not, I didn't want shaky cam. I wanted moving cameras, but I wanted it not shaky. And I really just thought we were just gonna oh it would have been so cool to to be able to intercut all of this stuff with really elegant live action photography but that was equally dynamic and interesting but without having to rely on i mean i wanted it very very composed and fluid that was very very oh yeah you, you because, all you can hear is, is you know again i i really don't like shaky cam and i really like composed shots especially in star trek you know, we've seen it beginning in 2009 with a lot of shaky cam mm. and these whip pans and things like that. Well, they can hear the video. We can't. Elegant. Every shot was going to be elegant yeah. in this film. I really wanted to convey a, a beauty with, with everything. So here the Ares manages to break the Dragon Claw formation by damaging uh, the D6s. And then we were going to do this incredible, uh, the Icarus maneuver is, is what you're seeing right here. And I really got it out of Vonda McIntyre's Star Trek novel, The Entropy Effect, which was the first Star Trek novel that was published after the Star Trek The Motion Picture novelization. And in it, Sulu is doing this starship combat, and he was tumbling starships end over end. And I'm like, wow, we, we've never seen that before, but wouldn't that be cool if we did that? So here Tobias nailed it with this animatic the, the, the dynamic shot I wanted, the, the, the Ares flips over and comes right back at you, you know, like some jungle cat jumping on its prey. And that's, you know, that's really what I wanted. I mean, look at this shot. Wouldn't it be great to really a moment where you're going to cheer? And then from this position, the, the Ares was just going to leap on its prey, which was one of these damaged D6s. And what I wanted to have happen now was something, again, we haven't seen before. I wanted it to use, the Ares would use its phasers and cleave off one of the warp nacelles and, and just dive straight in. So I, I told Tobias, no photon torpedoes. I mean, even though we had photon torpedoes at first, maybe we'd do this thing. I mean, I thought this might have been a little too much where it would flip over, it would hit it with torpedoes, it would literally flip upside down. And then once, once that had happened... <laughs> then the Ares would finish jumping on the D6, but it would use its phasers. Once the D6 was flipped over, it would use its phasers. And I took this picture. I'm like, this is the shot I want. I balanced this model of this D7 on my on my feet, and I had the Ares coming straight at you. And I said, Tobias, I want it to cleave off the nacelle with its phasers. It's like a cutting torch, and you just whack. 
and just cut off almost like, you know, a, a gladiator with, with a sword cutting off a limb. So the Ares would cut off the limb of the D6, which was the warp nacelle, and suddenly plasma, engine plasma, would start spilling out in space everywhere. And then this would happen <laughs> after, here's the shot. You know, again, these shots were, were not ever quite finished yet. I mean, I still had changes, but we got sued. But this is what was going to happen next. The Ares was going to grab the warp nacelle, the cleaved off warp nacelle, and carry it with its, with its tractor beam to the second D6 and basically use kinetic action and throw the warp nacelle into the other D6. Six. No, I'm not going to lie. I mean, this is the eight-year-old in me coming out going, <laughs> what can we do that would just be totally badass, you know, that we haven't seen before? And this is probably something I would have thought was the coolest thing in the world when I was eight. Now, I don't know how scientifically accurate this is, but basically, I, I wanted to see one starship throw a warp nacelle into the face <laughs> of another starship and you know crash right through the shields and and again Tobias's first animatic this first animatic he did not this one but the reverse it was funny because he sent me the first animatic and it cuts off right before what I would call the money shot and this was the uh, original animatic the Klingon ship comes around and and he cut it off the animatic stopped and I was like wait what dude and, and then he sent me this animatic, and now I'm going to share with you an email exchange he and I had after I saw this animatic. <laughs> so this is what I wrote to Tobias after seeing that animatic. October 12th, 2015, 10.19 a.m. Tobias, just watching these new animatics and 22B made me burst out laughing. Best shot ever. Oh my God, this is so good. Now again, if I wasn't already having fun, the next part of this scene is that the D6 is going to explode and all of the plasma that's been floating through space ignites. Well, Bill, that was a, <laughs> a, 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 a march down memory lane, but I have to say, seeing Vatic throw the Elios at the Titan, yeah, I was like, finally. Very you, and, <laughs> you and I, You and I were not on, I mean, this was back, by the way, we did this back in 2015, or yeah, 2015. Wow, 2015, yeah. Seven, eight years ago. Yeah. And uh, it was it, fun. I, I, but I, when, when you see Vatic's ship, the Shrike, you know, take the Elios with the tractor beam and throw it at the Titan, right. I was like, I was like, we were there, man. We knew. We knew. Right. <laughs> what I love at the end of the episode, too, the, t the Titan warps in and breaks the tractor beam. Oh, my God. Is, okay, we talked like, about that. That's so smart. I mean, wasn't that a f just fuck yeah moment? Yeah, yeah and, it's, and it's a little bit of an homage to, to a moment like that in, in First Contact when the Defiant is getting pummeled by the Borg Cube yep. and the Enterprise yep. e oh. comes cruising in. Like, it's so good. So oh, it, it's so good, and and you know what's really interesting about that is, and and because they don't directly connect it, it's 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 Liam Shaw who ordered that, right. and 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 when you see that, you gotta love him for doing oh, yeah. that thing. Yeah, yeah. I it's, mean, it's cool to see Starfleet people being professional and showing what they can do and it's and it just it's you know all of these little touches man terry metallis and his crew they just get it they just get it everybody who worked on this season you can just tell they put all the love and energy and detail and care and thought into every everything you see in here and it's so it's just like i i, I hope we get more of this kind of star trek i hope I hope this is this shows the powers that be, you know, at Paramount and CBS. Well, the path, the path to take, or a good path to take. But but whatever happens, I'm so thrilled that we get at least these ten episodes because yeah. what a, what a joy this is from the start to finish. What a joy. Well, I think the real the real question that any any IP owner, meaning the corporations or whatever, yeah. You have to they they the the question that they're not asking themselves is who 
I, I, I mean, it's it's not based on your resume or it's not right. based on where you went to school. It's based on right. your character. Yeah. And corporations don't understand how to define character or yeah. or the love of something. Well, and, you, you know, it's interesting because you just interviewed Jerry Bruckheimer not long ago. Yep. And Bruckheimer has been quoted as saying something recently that the secret to how, how was Top Gun Maverick so good? And the number one rule is when you if you're going to if you're if you're picking a franchise to work in a franchise property, a big IP, you have to be true to that IP. That's the number one rule of success. You've got to be true to it. And and, you know, and, it, and if you're not true to it, like honestly, uh, you know, like thoroughly. It does not say you can't add to it. You can't make it grow, bring new things into it, but you have to be true to the spirit of that IP and, and you have to do it with, you know, with, you know, the warmth for the IP. You have to, you have to love the IP to, to in order to get yourself in it and immerse yourself in it and understand what it is that makes people love that thing. And we, uh, time and time again, uh, we, whether it's Doctor Who Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Star Trek, it's it's a it's a business decision. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I get it. You know, corporations are looking at resumes. We want Ivy League educated business people to control Harvard our franchise. Right. Yeah, exactly. None of that translates to storytelling. No. And um uh again, you know, Terry Metalis is a guy that he he's a true Died in the wool fanboy. Yeah, the man owns a DeLorean time machine. <laughs> Does like, he? <laughs> it, yeah. If, if Universal needs to have like Doc Brown and Marty McFly show up somewhere, they call Terry and they're like, "Can we use not like DeLorean? not a diecast one, like an actual DeLorean time? No, machine. a real DeLorean, <laughs> a drivable time machine. Yep. The only thing wrong with it is is it doesn't travel through time. Well, you but know. you know what can you do? All details. That's like so, the phaser cocking the phaser rifle. It's like, uh, you know. Yeah, uh, but, but no, I mean, I mean, to, and the thing is, when when you see this, and you've seen six episodes, when you see the whole season unfold, the care and the love with which this season was developed. And what's interesting is they were working on a clock. They didn't have a lot of time because they had to roll right in from season two to season three. That's That's extraordinary to me. That's like, I yeah. want to know when Terry started writing this, like when he started breaking this and when he started, I mean, cause it's, Oh, it was, it was very totally, fast. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. It was very that's fast. Awesome. Like mad props, man. Cause, cause wow. You know, and we'll see, uh, we, 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 we will see. I mean, people, whether they love it or not. I mean, I, I think people will come around as it unfolds. Yeah, yeah, because people are they don't have they don't have a full picture yet. You've only got little pieces of it, a couple little pieces of it. And I and I think I think by episode 4, you especially by episode 4, you you will really see the method to the madness. Um and then it shifts gears as you've said. The first four episodes are kind of a piece and then it shifts gears. Um and I think Act if you two. Yeah, Act and two. it's just <laughs> so good. So good. Uh, and so. and what's interesting is as at the end of of episode 4 you might be weeping with joy and then on to episode 5. Right. You know, and and what what's funny is that what I find really interesting is is in terms of a uh, cultural zeitgeist where we're at in terms of fandom um there's a lot of people that are I find that that Picard season three might be a a Rubicon for fandom. Like yeah. there's a lot of people that were able to see it and and they were given access. It's not about the access. It's no. about the fact that a lot of people that were very I I I I was leading that charge was very anti modern Star Trek. And my conversion was because I saw something that was based in character, right. human nature, right. and great storytelling. And there's a lot of people that want they want to hate. Yeah. And what's great 100%. about what's what I love about this, those people, as they go in, as and I told Terry this, I said, you will win them over. Oh, 
as you well, well, as you, you go into the season, as you go further yeah. on, you cannot. There's there's going to be a point. Even Doomcock, yeah. who I have the 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 the, the even he <laughs> will reach a point where he's going to capitulate and say, you, yeah, yeah. "Okay, you, you'd have to okay. have a cold heart to not." warm up to these episodes as you see more and more. I mean, you know, our friends, the Inglorious Trexperts, Mark Altman and Darren Docterman, they, they're like us. They were very dubious and they haven't loved a lot of recent Star Trek and it won those guys over. I mean, it just, you know, it Look, you just- Look, Critical just Drinker, Gary Be Beekler, Nerdrotic, yes. Dave yeah. Cullen. I mean, we are well-known haters of modern Star Trek. Yeah. And if all of us- Since the very beginning, since- since the, like the, la the the la the last episodes of broadcast in the late '60s, the early '70s, the the syndication stuff, we've been around this thing forever, from the beginning, and it's like, it's just it, it is it rewards if you watch with an open heart and you keep watching with an open mind, it 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 will reward you. It will reward you. I agree, and it's it's an example of great television, well conceived and yes. well executed. And uh, how it happened, I, I don't know. I was, you know, I, I wanted to suggest that what you should do once all 10 of these episodes are done is see if you can get Terry and, and some of his people to come on and do like, like well, Terry's been on the, on, on the, yeah, I, I would love that. I mean, I, yeah. I, 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 I hope wanna... whoever's doing that, you know, I, I mean, you know, I did work with Roger Lay Jr. doing 15 Star Trek Blu rays. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know they and have the somebody. Way, behind the scenes but i would love to see i mean i, I and I'll, I'll i'll you know both terry and todd statuick yeah. have been on the show yeah i absolutely. would love to have todd and terry come on by the way terry metallis uh directed the last two episodes episodes uh, nine and ten uh, i can't wait to see him so not only did he he shepherd this into existence he put his entire professional reputation on the line for episodes nine and ten, and delivered a fucking barn burner of I a climax. I can't wait, and I'll say what there had better be at the end of this. There had better be a 4K Ultra HD release of of this season. Well, they're releasing I, Strange New Worlds in 4K, they right? Are. Yeah, I mean, they I, are. I, I don't. And, and the Star Trek: The Next, Next Generation feature films are coming out on on uh, May fourth. All of them in a look. On 4K I, I, I think I think when this is over, everyone will say, "I wish this was." The feature film we got, but you know what? We yes. got it now. Yep, and we got I'm, it now. I'm it's back. it's it's like a great novel as it unfolds. It's a great Star Trek novel. It's a great story. And, and if it ends up being the final chapter, it's a really fitting. It's a really fitting final chapter for this crew. And ironically, when when Terry Metalis said, "I'm going to give the Next Generation crew the final send off they deserve," and I'm like, "Oh, really? Uh, my, uh, uh, you know, all good things wasn't that?" <laughs> right. You know, and Terry writes me back. He's like, "Well, I really like Free Enterprise," and I was like, "Oh man!" And I I wrote him back. I said, "I really like Twelve Monkeys because it was really good. Yeah. It was four seasons of awesome time travel." timey wimey stuff that was really thought out yeah he really did a good job thinking about it well i'll tell and you you know what he does a really good job thinking about this and by the way i'm not going to say it's perfect let me just say yeah. there are i even have questions after it's over i mean yeah i mean th this show swings for the fences but there's a few things i'm like hmm i've got questions yeah as i would with anything well, and, and I, yeah, I just, I want to know how this happened and how it came about. And like, I, I want to know the stories behind the scenes and, and there's so much, that, but it's just such a joy to watch. It's just, it, it's fun to watch. And it's, this is Star Trek. That's fun again for me. Like it has right, been me too. For a long time. Me too. And if nothing else, it's that. And it's, we get to catch up with these characters and we see them get to a new place and we see character, you know, plot lines from, you know, the 30 plus years ago that were unresolved get filled in and it's lovely. It's by the lovely. way, by the way, can I just, I just want to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put the brakes. This has nothing to do with the penultimate episode of TNG's first season, Conspiracy. Right. For all of you people that are wondering whether the conspiracy aliens are back, I'm sorry. I'm going to shatter it. I can't deal with it. I'm tired of getting the DMs. I'm like, oh, my God, it's a conspiracy, Alice. No. no. <laughs> it's not. 
It's not the consp- that that was dumb. You know what? You know what people love about that episode? What I love the first thirty minutes when the aliens show up. It's ridiculous. Yeah. The first thirty minutes are awesome. Some of yeah. it peak TNG, f- especially yeah. from the first season. It's just yeah, not right. That good. It, as much as you can say that anything from that first season was peak TV, but I will say that one of my favorite episodes of that entire series, one of my favorite episodes of Star Trek, period, is the Measure of a Man, and that that's has season two though. Do. Yeah, season two, but right, but still early, very very early, and it's like. Because that's all about character and all about what Star Trek is is at the heart of it. And, and I, you know, I won't belabor the point, but the extended version on the season two DVD set or the Blu-ray set is pretty much yeah. because of me. It was yeah. also released it's theatrically. It's really good. Just all those, by the way, if anybody hasn't has got those Blu-rays and hasn't watched all those extras, Rob and Roger Lay Jr. did. I mean, so much great work on those things. It's it's they're just tremendous you should check those and, out. and by the way enterprise and, and roger lay shepherded that you know it's somebody somebody put up the uh the round table conversation we did with the crew and i'd forgotten how good it was i was i cut yeah. it and shot i was one of the camera people and i was like wow this yeah is really good. so good so good. good for us well bill i know you have to go you have guests yeah. yes um but let me ask you this um, well, i guess by the way watching star trek picard tonight Wow. Okay. That's why. That's why my guests are here. So, if you could give me a summation now. Now, this is about episode two, disengage. Yeah. What can you tell the audience right now about this episode, and where are you? Pretend you're watching it for the first time. You've now seen season episode two. What do you think? What can you tell people? Why should they well, continue? Well, I think we're into we're into a mystery. We've seen a villain. We've seen some dire circumstances. We've seen a couple surprises. We're starting to get the old band back together, but we're not even close. We're not even close to done. We're not even close to. We're not even. We're not even at, at the end of the beginning yet. Like it. It's. It keeps coming, and the surprises keep coming, and and the characters keep coming, and the moments keep getting earned. And keep watching. Keep watching. I uh, listen. If you're doubting at all, watch the first four episodes. And if by the end, if by the end of episode four, the show hasn't won you over, then maybe it's not for you. But I think if you if you watch with an open mind, through through at least and four an episodes, open heart, it'll get you. It'll get you. It will get you. Well, Bill, where can people find you? I mean, obviously, it says right below they can find you at thedigitalbits.com. Digital but com and. You can find me on uh, Facebook and Twitter at Bill Hunt Bits and also at The Digital Bits. And by the way, I know a little something about what you've been doing in your spare time. Yeah. You have been writing novels. Yes. Uh, you're already already a great writer and a published author. Um, tell us a little bit about, maybe if you could, not to put you on the spot, but sure. you are into, tell me what you've been writing. So I'm writing, a, uh, I'm, I set out to write a science fiction novel and did and completed the first novel, but came up with a story that was so big that it, it became a series of novels. And uh, in order to, in order to really launch these things properly, I'm writing a second, I'm writing a second one now um, that is going to probably be released first. Um, and it, it, what we're probably going to do when, as soon, when I'm done with, as soon as I'm done with it, we're going to probably do a Kickstarter to do a self-published version of that first, of that first novel. And the idea being then I can use that, hopefully, you know, move a lot of units, maybe attract a publisher and then really properly launch all of the novels and keep going. I've, I've got, I've got a plan for at least, I've got a story that will take me through at least six novels. Um, and it's been the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Um, hard science fiction. Uh, it's, it's I, and not, not like anything you've really ever seen before. Um, kind of it's in, in a little bit of in its own wheelhouse. The Expanse is kind of close, maybe the Martian kind of similar, but not it's it's very much its own thing. And um, and it's, you know, it's it's about it's about building a future we all want to we all want to see. That's the idea. So hopefully this year, hopefully in the coming months, I'll have uh, some news about that. And but they're really coming along. I've, I've got almost I've got almost two full novels completed. Well, Bill, I want to thank you for being here on this episode see episode two of season three of the curlin nascios the picard after show thank you for the being third here dynasty, if i'm not mistaken the what's that the third dynasty from it's, the third dynasty you I'm are right. correct you are correct <laughs> and for those who don't know uh here is the artifact there you go 
Uh, it's right there, and uh, you know we're 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 restoring it to its glory. But and sculpture. But Bill, thank you for being here, and um, it's a pleasure. We'll 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 probably be. Uh, I by the way, I wanted to hit you up. Uh, Sunday is the 100th episode of Let's Get Physical Media. Oh, I'd love you to jump on if you have the time. I could probably find some time to do that. All right, then we'll see you then, Bill. Right, thank you for being here, sir. Sounds good. All right. Uh, all right. Care. See you later. Take care. Uh, thanks very much to Bill Hunt, the digitalbits.com. Go see him. Uh, and all of that is, he's an amazing guy. Now, that said, I'm going to take a break for just a second, and then I'm going to be back to answer your super chats, answer your questions. Super chats, the tip feature is down below. You can hit a link, and you've got, there's some great, great questions and i will be right back Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. It is I, and once again, I'm back. Welcome to this Picard After Show. I want to thank Bill Hunt for being here, and now it's all about you guys. There's a lot of super chats and tips. I'm going to go through and talk about them. Uh, first of all, Julius Goodwin, who is actually the sommelier of this channel, believe it or not, we have an official Sommelier. Julia says, I have to admit, I never thought you'd be so complimentary of this series. Starting out, you did not seem to be much of a fan. Well, Julius, I was not. Um, look, I went into this as I go into every Star Trek project. I want to love it. I want to love it. But the thing is, it's it's you have to understand that the people that make our entertainment are not the people that watch our entertainment and they're certainly not the people that watch it the way we do and um unfortunately star trek is not 
it was a it w- it was a failed program in its inception. It lasted three seasons and it only got a second a uh, third season because uh, the Trimbles, B. Joe and uh, is it John Trimble? And by the way, they were B. Joe Trimble. The queen of Star Trek fandom, the woman who wrote the Star Trek Concordance that I memorized, was at the premiere of Star Trek Picard season three at the Chinese theater. I mean, even I, I couldn't even like I talked to Jerry Bruckheimer this week. You, you can see that interview on the John Campion channel. Look up Designing Hollywood. I can talk to Jerry Bruckheimer. I, I couldn't I couldn't talk to B. Joe Trimble. But anyway, um, you know, it's it's it, being a Star Trek fan has been tough. It's been tough. Uh, I just want to see great Star Trek. And I'll tell you something. People have always asked me. I, I, I wanted to take this moment. Uh, people have said, Rob, you know, uh, you, you always talk about Star Trek novels. And uh, I've often been critical, especially of Strange New Worlds, for ripping off Star Trek novels. I thought if you're going to you know, incorporate Star Trek novels into your Star Trek, you would uh, credit the people that wrote them. So people are always asking me. So every week uh, that we do this show, I mean, this is there's going to be 10 episodes. This is episode uh, two of 10. I would suggest that everybody read. This is my copy. Um, if you want to read a great Star Trek novel, this came out around the time of Star Trek Generations. This is Judith and Garfield Reeve Stevens. They've written a lot of great books on Star Trek, both fiction and nonfiction. This is their novel, Federation. If you want to read a great Star Trek novel or just a great novel in general, this book is fan-fucking-tastic. Um, there's so much joy to be found in this book if you're a true diehard Star Trek fan and you know canon and all of that. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. So people are always asking me. So for the next uh, episodes of this show every week... I will be showing you another Star Trek novel that is essential. This is essential. This book is incredible. So, anyway, that's how much of a geek I am. So, <clears throat> let's see what we have going on here. Um, so, Julius, to answer your question, look, I was as blown away as anyone to love this season of Star Trek Picard as much as I do. And I'll tell you, you know, when I was when I first started watching it, I'm like, okay, um, I was very quiet. I mean, not that there was someone to talk to, but I was very, I, I was sitting there, I had access to it, and I was watching it, and um, look, I wasn't supposed to be watching it, but I was watching it, and I think if memory serves, I got to episode five, and there's an exchange in episode five, and I had to stop. I was like, I, 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 I couldn't believe what I was watching, to be honest. And uh, not to oversell it, but um, you know, it's a slow burn. You got to let it unfold. It's a, it's a movie in ten hours. I know it's a strange concept, but that's what it is. One through four is Act One. Five through eight is Act Two. Episodes 9 and 10, the shattering climax. And I'm telling you, it will work. And if you're if you're still on the fence after episode 2, I understand. You might be on the fence after episode 3. And I, I know people say, well, Rob, what about the first episode of the bunk bed scene? Some people are on, on board then. But I guarantee you, look, if you're not hooked in by the end of episode 4, hey, maybe it's not for you. Come back and tell me. I want to hear about it. Uh, Aurora Uplinks sends in a tip and says, I just wanted to pitch my idea for a TV show for Trek. Takes place just after TNG and DS9. War happens again. This time the Duros family rises up and the Duros sisters and starts a full-blown Klingon civil war again. The Durosses have found an ancient civilization who aid them. Here's the thing. Uh, not to belabor the point, but the Star Trek novel series has gone for decades beyond that. And um, I don't mean to say that idea is not, it's not bad, but 
there look i i really wish <laughs> paramount made a lot of tom clancy movies they made hunt for Red october they made patriot games they made clear and present danger they made some of all fears and then suddenly they, they decided to make uh a jack ryan shadow recruit with chris pine that wasn't canonical and wasn't adapting a book but okay anyway um aurora not a bad idea but just so you know the Star Trek novels, and I love, I'm a huge Star Trek novel fan. They were they were great. And they are great. Well, to be honest, after the three-part Coda novel series, I checked out. Oh, I know, it's terrible. Uh, let's go back and see what you guys are saying in the Super Chats. Zigzag became a new member of the channel. Why, thank you, Zigzag. Uh, Joe Panora became a member of the channel. And then Joe Panora goes on and sends in a super chat and says, RMB, you were right. That scene with Picard and Crusher at the end of episode two with no word exchanged, it hit me like a sledgehammer in the feels. The, co I mean, the close ups on there, it was amazing. That was amazing. That's Star Trek. That's Star Trek. And uh, there's a lot of people that, didn't get there you know i understand it's fine but i'm glad i mean joe first of all thanks thanks for becoming a member and uh i'm glad you dug that because it was great that moment was great orville nation uh says if season three of picard was instead the first season of picard how do you think it would change our perception of this season rob well here's here's look my problem with Star Trek Picard, it's a great question, by the way, um, is I didn't believe seasons one of two, one and two of Picard. I didn't believe them. I mean, as the Viceroy of Verisimilitude, I didn't believe either one of those seasons. I believe Star Trek Picard season three. I believe where our characters are at. I mean... There are here's the thing. There are there are elements of stuff sprinkled into season one and two that Terry Metalis and his writers gravitated towards. For instance, the idea that the Rikers, Deanna and and uh, William Riker lost a son, Thaddeus. I love that idea. It, it, not that I love the fact they lost a son, but losing a child is horrific, and that idea is weaved into season three. I think the next episode is called 17 Seconds. I think that's episode three. Um, wait, wait, wait till you hear. I mean, the even the episode titles are really well uh, integrated. I mean, they're, they're, yes, there are things that are talked about in the episodes, but they're really pertinent and they mean something. And um, so you, you that was in Picard season one, uh, uh, Nepenthe or whatever. Uh, and they added to that. It's great stuff. So I would say that the answer to that question is, would I like, would I have liked this to be the first or maybe even only season of Picard? Certainly. But, um, you know, um, it's it's hard to say. I mean, it's it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough thing to identify because it's woulda, coulda, shoulda. I I I I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Jason S sends in a tip and says, "Rob, I'm writing a book called 2024. It's about how Shakespeare's plays cannot be considered objectively good." since all of his plays were eradicated in 2024 when the diversity and inclusion groups had them permanently re-edited to appease the woke censors. Well, Jason S., that's a, I love that idea, actually. Um, I will read your book. That that sounds great. I, and I don't know if anyone watched my last Rob Observations when I talked about Roald Dahl, but... Um, <laughs> ideology is fashion that's the world we live in today and i'm not a fan of it so um uh i already did john miller uh rrtnz says hail rob or hail bob 
loving Picard so far because it's real Trek, but also glad you're vindicated by this. You and Dave Cullen need to stream together regularly. Well, listen, I, I've been a fan. I'm a huge fan of Dave Cullen. Um, and by the way, if you guys haven't been uh, watching it, Dave Cullen has been doing a great series of reviews about 70s dystopian sci-fi. And they're really good. I mean, what's interesting is is uh, those are movies I grew up on. I know most of them by uh, by rote. Uh, but but I think that, that Dave is, I mean, he's younger than me because I'm an old fuck, but he's revisiting them for the first time and watching him, he, you, uh, pardon me, he's not revisiting them, he's visiting them for the first time. Uh, and I think he's doing a great job. I really like, he's picking all the great films. I mean, the movies, some of the things that he hasn't done yet that I think he needs to watch, A Boy and His Dog. Dave Cullen needs to watch A Boy and His Dog. The problem is he's been watching all of the bigger budgeted films, and there's a lot of 70s dystopian sci-fi I wish he would look at. A Boy and His Dog being probably the most prominent. I also hope he looks at John Carpenter's Dark Star. I know he made it as a, as a film student, but it'd be, I'd, I'd love to hear what Dave Cullen thinks of Dark Star. Dave, if you don't like it, don't blame me. MV Prime uh, sends in a super chat, and and he's it, this is the first time MV Prime has ever sent in a super chat to this channel. Well, thank you, MV Prime. I appreciate that. Thanks for watching. Uh, Rampage Predacon has been a member for four months. Darren L. Minnesota says that look between Beverly and Picard on the bridge right i mean that was that said everything and by the way give it up for gates mcfadden my god uh what a great moment for her really what a great moment i uh, th that was just beautiful really really good envy prime sends in a super chat and says uh terry metallis was also showrunner for season two and came up with a time travel story but did he not have as much control? No, no, no. Terry Metalis was brought in to write a few episodes, but he didn't have control. Uh, what happened was, was Akiva Goldsman went on to do Strange New Worlds, and Alex Kurtzman left, and he went on to do his... And I have to say this. can't believe I'm going to say this. So Alex Kurtzman went on and did basically a sequel to Nicholas Rogue's film from 76, The Man Who Fell to Earth, starring Chiwetel Ejiofor. Uh, the Man Who Fell to Earth is based on a novel by Walter Tevis, who also wrote The Hustler, the sequel The Color of Money, and wrote one of my favorite science fiction novels I've ever read called Mockingbird. And I'll tell you guys a funny story. I, I, I can't, I, I don't know where I met her, when I met her, or even if I met her. I might have dreamt this. But I met a Hollywood producer who told me a story that she was getting mugged by somebody. I want to say in Beverly Hills. Somebody mugged her, like at gunpoint. And and she, because she had chutzpah. So she's being mugged, and she's turning over her money, her billfold, whatever, and she actually asked her mugger, well, what do I get out of this? And the mugger, the guy mugging her, gives her Walter Tevis's novel, Mockingbird, that I think came out in 1980. And this is the same man that wrote The Hustler, The Color of Money, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Great novelist. And I read that book because the, the, the cover, the paper, I only saw the I don't know if there was a hardcover. I only saw the paperback. And the paperback of Mockingbird, if memory serves, it had like New York City. It was an angry orange. And you could see through the Empire State Building. It's a great book. But that was the story this woman told me. And I don't know if I met her at a party. I don't even remember. But that's the story. Maybe I made that up. I don't know. But I, I want to say that's a true story. But anyway... Why I'm telling you this, I don't know. 
But anyway, um, so Terry Metalis did not have full control over Picard season two. Picard season three, oh, that's why, because Alex Kurtzman went off and made uh, The Man Who Fell to Earth. But there you go. So yeah, Terry Metalis made season, he, he did all of it. It's totally different. Hired his composer. By the way, I met his composer and his uh, composer's wife and their daughter. Delightful. By the way, come on, how great is the music? Unbelievable. Christopher Mays says, you have the right mindset for canon. Well, I'm glad to hear that because, look, I'm a canonista. I'm a canon pornographer, as it were. Um, I, I, I am a believer in Star Trek canon. I don't, um, what can I say? And, and the thing about canon is you have to... You have to allow for the so, for those of you who don't know the 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 canon of something is the truth of it. Like the as far as Star Trek history is concerned, Star Trek history, the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise, those are canonically factual. So the things that happen in those shows happened in the Star Trek universe, Star Trek lore. That is the canon of Star Trek, just like there's the Western canon of literature or anything else. However, within that canon, there's lots of room to interpret how things, we don't know all of the things that happened, so you can still change things, and and Terry does this. His writers do this. Like I said, um, it's a small thing, but they they one of the things I love about this season of Picard is they 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 tell us that the holodeck has a use that has never been mentioned and it has a certain i thought it was great i was like oh my god that's so amazing now it doesn't change your life it's not some shattering plot point but when you think about it it's really clever and it means the writers that terry hired were thinking that's what i love that's what i love Ghost Rider has been a member of the channel for seven months. Thank you, Ghost Rider. And Ghost Rider says, there is a reason that Axanar stuff made it into Picard Season 3, Rob. Just like it wasn't chance Terry reached out to you to preview the season. Well, I did Terry reach out to me? I didn't know Terry. Um, you know, we we started talking. Look, there are a lot of people that reached out to me when uh, Discovery jumped to the 31st century because um, I had worked, uh, Chris McQuarrie, Brian Singer, and I at a, a sake-soaked uh, dinner in Seattle talked about doing a new Star Trek series. And, um, and that, that treatment has found its way online. Um, and my Star Trek Axnar, the Star Trek Axnar Origins, uh, those three videos have been online for years. And look, to me, it's all open source. I don't own Star Trek. I don't think Terry reached out to me. I don't think he's seen any of the Axnar stuff. I don't I don't believe that. Uh, he didn't even write the episode where the, the Helios is flung into the Titan. So, you know... I don't, I don't think that, but it's nice that you think so. I mean, and by the way, thanks for being a member of the channel. I mean, I can't, there, there's, here's the thing. Why did Armageddon and Deep Impact happen at the same time? What happened? Or, or why do the, the fucking idiots who made Discovery, why is it that Neil Druckmann and the people that made Discovery talk about the mycelial network? They all watch the same nature documentary in like 2008. I mean, that I'm telling you, that's why that stuff happens. Um, so, and then people start thinking about the same stuff. Why is there a micellular network in Discovery? And why is the cordyceps virus or the cordyceps fungal infection of humanity happening? Because both of those people, all those people watch the same nature documentary in 2008. <laughs> They did. Um, Aurora Uplinks says, making an edit of Disco to make it Trek. 
can't, eh? No, you really can't. By the way, Aurora Uplinks became also a member of the channel. Thank you, Aurora Uplinks. I appreciate that. For those of you who don't know, if you want to become a member of this channel, every other Saturday, not this Saturday because we did one last Saturday, but next Saturday, we have a, a week from two days from now, we have member chats that last four hours a lot of the time. They, they start at 11 o'clock on Saturdays and usually go till two or three um, where we just shoot the shit and uh, it's a lot of fun. And I love seeing everybody there. So uh, you can become a member of the channel and join in a week from Saturday. Swack props, Cal. Okay. I don't usually, I, you know, I'm not going to advertise everybody who has something to sell, but Swack props, Cal. You have to go to his Etsy store. Swack props, South props, because he's on the South Island. Um, Swack Props is a mad genius. So if you want to find a movie prop that is paper-based, like a book, for instance, Rorschach's Journal from Watchmen, or if you want to find the map to the Misty Mountains from Lord of the Rings, that if you shine black light on it, you can see the runes. Go to Swack Props' Etsy store. Trust me, if you go there, you'll be amazed, and I can assure you that Swack Props will make you one of the coolest things you'll own. I mean, I tell everyone, it's only a single, it's on parchment, it's amazing. That Misty Mountains map from Lord of the Rings, that alone. Buy it from Swack, get it framed, it's amazing. So Swack Props says, you were right, Rob. The first two episodes filled me with joy. There were moments in this episode when Sir Patrick Stewart got his Picard voice back. And it was glorious. It was, right? Swack, it totally was. It totally was. I totally agree. And by the way, I cannot stress enough, if you have a, a, a family member who's a fan, or if you are a fan, I mean, whether it's the Donnie Darko book, whether it's the, the Misty Mountains book, whether it's, I mean, even even the, the, the Lament configuration from Hellraiser, Swack Props, He's your man. Check out his Etsy store. Uh, Aurora Uplinks says, I think AK's main mistake, uh, Alex Kurtzman's main mistake, was not knowing the lore and vibe of Star Trek. He wanted modern video game sci-fi styles when he could have made something else. I don't know what he could have made, but... Um, oh, he could have made countless stories with the Star Trek vibe and color scheme and would have been loved by fans. For instance, a series about the ramifications of DS9's wars. I appreciate the truth. Never fear give me that gift. Well, uh, Aurora Uplinks, I, I, uh, I totally agree with you. I mean, here's the thing, though. Like, I have to say, as a Star Trek... I've been reading Star Trek novels since I was a little kid. And uh, Pocket Books... They got the rights from Bantam um, when Star Trek the Motion Picture came out. And there were different, um, there was there was Wallaby. There were different publishers underneath. Pocket Books was one of them. And was it Simon & Schuster, I think. And they, the Star Trek publishing empire, they published hundreds and hundreds of Star Trek novels. And I will give complete credit to a man I actually admire very much, uh, John Van Sitters from Paramount. He was really the keeper of the flame when it came to licensed uh, products. I didn't I, I didn't really get to meet him until I was working on him and Miriam Cordry and um, uh, at Paramount. They did such a good job of making sure, especially the publishing, that Star Trek novels, I mean, my God, there, there are hundreds of them. There's probably... I th actually, or more, there's more Star Trek novels than Star Trek episodes. And the post DS9 books were amazing. And, um, you know, there's so many I could recommend, but, but they, they did a great job. Unfortunately, um, <laughs> because of Star Trek Picard seasons one and two, 
the the Star Trek continuity that they had spent 20 years building up, 20 years, had to be swept away because none of it matched up with Star Trek Picard Seasons 1 and 2. So they had to get rid of it in a great three-part... I mean, hey, man, if, if I could buy the Star Trek franchise, I would hire uh, James Swallow and... and um, and 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 everybody, I mean David Mack, the great David Mack, to to write their Star Trek co- coda about modern Star Trek and get rid of it and bring back the original continuity. But that's just me. Um, a D W wait, D W O M T says, I know you can't spoil anything. But the first episode of season three kept giving a lot of love towards the Enterprise D for some reason. Um, it doesn't feel like it's just for nostalgia's sake. Well, I mean, it is though because the entire Next Generation crew we 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 knew them and we loved them because they were on the Enterprise D. Um, look, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. The Enterprise D was the drive section was blown up and the saucer section crashed on viridian three in generations which great miniature shot by the way um so i mean i don't know what to tell you i think the real question is what happened to the enterprise e which by the way uh i mean the enterprise d is 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 been taken off the board but everyone wants to know what happened to the enterprise e and look i'm not gonna say just you gotta keep watching everyone loves the enterprise e E, right now we've seen the enterprise f in the marketing and that was a star trek online chip i like the enterprise f i think it's the enterprise f school we know it's in the show somewhere so what happened to the enterprise e and what happened to the enterprise f or what is happening with the f i'm not going to say but um just keep watching but you know we love the d i mean why do they have to say you know it's funny i mean uh, if if sensitivity watchers, they would have said, uh, when Riker says, oh, the Enterprise D is the fat one, uh, sensitivity watchers would have said, oh, no, 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 no. You're fat shaming the Enterprise D. You can't, you can't do that. I mean, maybe there's a reason she fell out of the sky. I don't know. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think the, look, this whole show is about the next generation crew and the next generation crew, the enterprise D was, was their jam until it was the enterprise E in first contact. And, uh, and then the E was wrecked in nemesis. So, uh, you know, Christopher Wolf 72 says, I am loving season three of Picard. Give us a series with seven as captain show ran by Terry Metalis, please. What a relief to watch real Trek again. Um, I don't know, man. I, I, you know, unfortunately, Terry's not working on uh, Star Trek at all now. He was over at Disney producing the pilot for Escape to Witch Mountain. I hope it's great. I mean, look, maybe somebody like, uh, if I had my druthers, I would love to see Terry Metalis run a new Star Trek show. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily see a scenario where. Uh, seven of nine is captain of a ship. I don't know. Maybe that'll work. I mean, maybe Terra Metallis could figure that out. Um, I know he's known Jerry Ryan for a long time. That could be cool. Uh, but I, I just look. I think Terry understands Star Trek, and I'd love to see him uh, continue on. But he's not hired. I mean, the thing is, if Bad Robot wants to keep the franchise, um, they should just give Terry the franchise and not worry about it and go do other things. <laughs> I mean, why not? But again. No one knows this yet. And and by the way, the only thing that's going to tell anyone is analytics. you got to watch the show. Hopefully people will like the show. Beatnik says, I shook hands with Leonard Nimoy in the mid-1980s. He was a super nice guy. He was. I mean, um, you know, I uh, we made a 70th uh, birthday video for William Shatter. God, 22 years. Do you know that William Shatter is going to be 92 years old? On March 22nd. It's true. 92. Amazing. Um, but Nimoy was so great. We went to his house. 
and filmed a uh, uh, he shot we shot a video of him wishing uh, Bill Shatner a happy birthday for his 70th birthday and it was it was delightful it was really nice really nice um uh, Chris Chris actually uh hang on a second there's there's some more uh, tips in here first of all Darth Plato our friend Darth Plato longtime member longtime viewer of the show our resident historian. Darth Plato says, hey, Rob, mixed opinion on Picard so far, but I'm watching it. I have a big problem with how Picard Riker got a ship. Also, I don't believe at all that a captain would talk like that. I don't believe that this is a real military. Angle is all wrong. Well, I I can understand that, but, you know, you've got command level guys talking to each other unfettered by the um by military protocol but you're not wrong i can i can see that uh all i can say is keep watching especially the next two episodes i think you're uh, in for a treat chris sends in a tip chris says thanks for sticking out your uh, sticking your neck out and giving cover to all the fans who had legit gripes about new trek over the last five years in the face of all the gaslighting I'm finally glad we're getting something great in live action. And by the way, you know what's funny? How great it is, you guys don't even know yet. I mean, we're just, it's not a mystery box. It's a very calculated, well-plotted out techno thriller. That's not a mystery box. They know what's going on. And it'll unfold that way and you'll see how it goes. Many questions will be answered by the end of episode four. Uh, RRTNZ says, our friend RRTN, just watch episode two, Rafi, not great, uh, over the top and clunky exposition, but Worf's entrance is real. Fuck yeah moment. Great to see him back in form. Yeah, he is. I mean, you know, Rafi, I can understand that. I mean, I get why... Some people don't dig Rafi, but, you know, there's a lot of tropes in there. Like when she had to do drugs, I mean, that's that's a well-worn movie thing. I mean, I thought that was kind of clever that they made her do that, you know, and, and they, they played on that. I mean, she's an undercover cop, essentially. So, but I, I, I get that. I mean, look, it's, it's, Rafi is Rafi, and I don't, I don't know, I can't even imagine uh what it would have been like if Rafi wasn't in the show what people might have said I mean I I was never a a fan of the Rafi character I mean a woman of color drug addicted and living in a trailer in the first season not a good look but I, I all I can tell you is that her relationship with Worf which you can imagine continues on it's pretty great it's pretty great so just keep watching um, Journey's End said, I'm realizing, I'm realizing now that the key ingredient to making good Star Trek is making Starfleet and the Federation believable. 100%. If you make me think they exist, I can buy the story you tell in that world. Dude, you got it. 100%. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I cannot... I mean, here's the thing. You make the space navy believable, then you 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 have everyone. Um and and that was my problem. I I have not believed even even if you look at Discovery, here's what I I still harp on this, but the scenes they show in the, with the turbo lifts, which are these like they look like they're on roller coaster tracks in a vast empty space. That in itself shows me that no one, not the showrunners, not the visual effects people, no one has any understanding of Star Trek or space or ships or anything at all. And <laughs> what was it? The end of season three? Was that where there's the battle on the, they're having a fist fight and it's like you're in the middle of a city. And I'm like, who has anyone watched Star Trek ever at all? I mean, you look at that, it, it's fraudulent creation. The people that are working on the show and the visual effects people should know better. Somebody should have said, um, 
There's no empty space in a starship. Like, you have a hangar deck, and even that's a waste of space, but we have to receive ships, so okay. So bad. So bad. But you're right. Uh, at, once again, Journey's End says, if you make Starfleet and the Federation believable, you'll make good Star Trek. If you make me think they exist, I can buy the story you tell in that world. Journey's End, you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. 100%. Uh, Dan Candy says, when can we expect the first Deep Space Nine shout out? Who's to say you haven't already got one? Just saying, I mean, I, what can I tell you? I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, at, uh, on that note, uh, I think that I'm going to bring this episode of the Star Trek Picard Season 3 After Show to a close. Curly Neskios. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the reason the show is called what it is called is, of course, because of this artifact. Dalen Quace gave one of these to... Jean-Luc Picard in the sixth season Next Generation episode, The Chase. And uh, this was a revered object. And, of course, in Generations, it's basically on the floor, uh, thrown aside. But then Terry Metalis reestablishes the Curlin Neskios to its rightful glory. And here is a picture from the first episode of Picard season three. So anyway... That's why the show is called what it is called. I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank Bill Hunt from The Digital Bits. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank everybody for generously supporting this channel via Super Chats and Tips and memberships. Thank you so much. I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for being a great moderator. And by the way, he is goof people. Uh, starting in April... There's going to be a, a huge rebrand of this channel. It is no longer going to be called The Burnett Work. It will be called Imagination Connoisseurs Unlimited. That will better serve all of our new creators who are making great shows. Um, I haven't mentioned this. This will be the first time I've ever said it on this channel. We have a new show that I am not creating, but it is it is being brought to you by the same people that brought us Designing Hollywood, which I do host. And the new show is called Architects of the Imagination. And it will be conversations with the video designers, the video game designers of today. Uh, and we'll have more of that shortly. But coming April 2nd, there's a rebrand of this channel across the board. And the new channel name will be Imagination Connoisseurs Unlimited, the home of the post-geek singularity where we are all goof people. I want to thank everyone for watching the show, and I will see you tomorrow on the John Campia Show. And join us tomorrow night for Midnight Musings. I also want to thank Terry Metalis and everyone involved in creating Star Trek Picard Season 3. And all of you who continue to watch it, because all I can say is keep watching. It gets better and better and better. And with that, live long and prosper. <laughs>